TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than two dollars fifty per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I'm really excited about today's guest. I have Alexa Nazaro, and she is with Axel Author Services. And I'm really happy to have her on the show. She's going to talk to us all about the ins and outs of self-publishing, the three qualities you want from your book cover designer, book reviews. It's going to be a really interesting conversation. So, Alexa, welcome. Thank you so much, Chris. Thanks for having me. Yeah, just the、uh, FYI, there's construction around, so we're gonna, but、uh, we live in COVID time. So, you know, set the stage, talk about yourself, your business, how you got started, and、uh, we'll dive right into it. Oh. Okay, sure, no problem. So I am the leader of Axel Author Services. We are an author services agency. What we do is we partner with independent authors who want to do it alone, but they want to do it properly and they want to do it with professional expert support because publishing and self publishing in particular, it's a whole world. It's、uh, it can be very overwhelming, and so we're here to really shepherd them through the process. So in terms of our services, if somebody is starting out and they just have a manuscript, we're here to help them edit that manuscript, proofread all of that stuff, make sure they have the best manuscript possible, and then from there we pull together all the elements of publishing. Chris, you mentioned cover design. Interior layout, setting up all the metadata, figuring out the right categories for the book, and then of course, once the book is launched, it's all about marketing and finding your readers, and that's honestly one of the biggest parts of self-publishing is finding readers. So we really help in all of those areas with authors. Yeah, and so one question I have in these days and age is、um, this difference between self-publishing and going with a、um, publisher, and kind of talk about. The differences and why most people I know are just going with self-publishing. It's、uh, too much of a hassle to find the publisher. So talk about that. Sure, no problem. So we tr we traditionally have two routes. So we've got traditional publishing, like you were mentioning, Chris, where people go, they submit their manuscript for consideration. The traditional publisher will take them on, shoulder all the costs, and then of course there's a royalty split. So that's traditional publishing. The fact of the matter is, yes, it's really really hard to get a traditional publishing contract now. It it's and and what a lot of authors find is even if they do land a traditional Publishing contract, unless they have some kind of a track record, these publishers are going to be hesitant to pour a lot of marketing money into you because that's a gamble, and sometimes it's a gamble they're not willing to take. So it's almost that catch twenty two about you know, well, how do you know my book is any good if you're not willing to put some marketing dollars behind it? So traditional publishing it can be very very difficult. Not to mention that there's just the whole task of finding an agent. A lot of publishers, especially the bigger ones, they don't deal directly with authors. They want to speak to the author's agent, and that's just the way it goes. So we have that route. That is, I can't say it's less popular. I think for a lot of authors, deep down, they would still love to be picked up by a publisher. I'm not going to lie; it's just the way it is. But of course, there's self-publishing, and that's really it's pretty much self-described. You. Do it on your own. You decide that you've got a book. You wanted to find an audience, and so you can do it all on your own. And I always, I'm very honest with authors. Yes, find your own cover designer, your own proofreader, your own website designer. All of that is possible. <laughs> And 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 there are authors who do it, and that's fine. Or you can partner with a、uh, an entity like Axel Author Services, where we do all of that heavy lifting for you to make sure that you've got 
a really professionally published book because that's so critical because the stigma is still there. Oh, you're self-published. There are still a lot of people in the industry. They're snobby. They're not fans of self-published books. There's still a lot of there's still a lot of bias and prejudice against self-published books. So it's so important for self-published authors to have a mindset like a traditionally published author and really make sure their book is up to par. Yeah, it's really interesting. And um, it kind of reminds me because um, I've been um, watching, you know, um, like Netflix and Hulu and um, a lot of the A-list actors that you saw in the past. Now, you know, they were picked up by the major video studios and now they're like they're p getting picked up by um, Netflix and Hulu and these different contracts. And it's kind of reminds me of this, you know, the self-publisher because, um, you know, you could get a publisher, traditional publisher, but if you know how to leverage social media and, you know, your potential audience, build audience, build community, you can have a much greater impact compared to a traditional publisher. Plus, you have more like freedom and uh, yes. more ownership of your content and everything. Absolutely. No, it's a really, really nice position to be in. You do have that creative control because that's something else. I mean, if a traditional publisher picks you up, they might say, no, we don't like that title. We don't find that title marketable or we want you to change the ending. And I mean, there are stories like that. You were talking about the entertainment industry movies. There are stories about that even in entertainment. So that applies to, to publishing as well. And if a traditional publisher takes a chance on your work, well, they want to have a much bigger say in how things are going to unfold in terms of your book and its cover and its title and all of that. So that is definitely something to consider. And that's really, really important. You have that creative control. But I do always, I'm always honest with authors that if you're going to go the indie route, you it's got to be like a culture that you embrace. It's got to be a position that you embrace. I sometimes talk to authors and I can tell, okay, I guess I'll do this, but I'll keep sending out query letters and maybe just maybe a publisher will pick me up. And I actually don't want to work with authors like that only because you need to be in because being an independent author, it's exciting, but there's definitely an entrepreneurial aspect to it. And you know what? If that's not you, then you might not enjoy the indie author experience. And I I, I prefer being upfront about that with authors as opposed to hiding it. And then they say, oh, I've, I've got to engage a lot more than I thought I would. But the fact of the matter is the irony is a lot of traditionally published authors, they still have to hustle. They still have to do their own marketing. So authors are on their own for that one in many cases. Shipping can make or break a sale. So optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code POD. That's ShipStation.com with the code POD. This episode is brought to you by Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business. Want to advance your career or switch fields? An MBA from Carnegie Mellon's Tepper School of Business can help. Earn your degree from a top-ranked business school with a thought-provoking curriculum, one-on-one -on -one leadership coaching, support from experienced career counselors, and full-time online hybrid and accelerated MBA formats. Join the intelligent future. Visit cmu.edu slash Tepper to learn more. Yeah, it's quite, in, it's quite interesting. And um, kind of talk about, you know, the what you do for your customers and your clients and kind of, you know, walk us through the process if somebody's thinking they want to get self-published, like, um, you know, how do they start and kind of walk us through the process. And then if they want further, they can contact you in the links in the show sure. notes. Sure, not a problem. So if somebody comes to us with, with a manuscript, so they're at the very beginning of the process, the very first thing we do is we assess the manuscript because there are so many books being self-published every year. This is honestly a little bit of the downside. Some people could argue, well, everyone and anyone can publish a book. So standing out is so important. Cover design is a big part of that. But just starting with content that is worth reading is so important. So we always do an initial assessment where we're just honest with the author and we tell them, look, you know, this is actually really strong. We think you just need a proofread and you're ready to go. 
But writing can be difficult. And sometimes people might think they have something ready to go, but it's not ready to go. And we really take it upon ourselves to advise our authors accordingly. So there's that manuscript TLC that is such an important first step. So a lot of our authors will go through what we call a manuscript evaluation stage. Some people call it developmental edit. That's that's typically the industry term. And that's really a deep dive into the content. So for fiction, it's things like dialogue, uh, character development. For nonfiction, it's do you have a clear topic? Are you organizing your content? This is a really, this is a challenge sometimes for nonfiction authors. They have it all in their heads. They think it's so obvious and they just plunk it all down and then it's not organized well. It doesn't follow a good flow. So we look at all of those things and then from there, okay, now the manuscript content wise is good. It's up to par. Let's do that copy edit. Let's do that proofread. So now we assume assume we're getting all of that taken care of. And now we look at the book production side. So the book production side, the two pillars of that are cover design and interior layout. So the way we work with cover design is we have trusted designers that work with us on a regular basis. And what we task ourselves with is making sure the author feels that they have a great degree of creative control over the cover design process while still getting that guidance and input from experts, because otherwise, why don't they just do it on their own? So one of the first things we do is we actually have questionnaires that we ask the authors to fill out because we really want to know from them, what do they think their book is about? What would they like to see on the cover? And then what we do is we pick the right designer because we have different designers designers who specialize in different genre. And then what we'll do is we'll get on a, a brainstorming call with that designer and that author because we want authors to also feel they we want them to know who's working on their book. Sometimes there are other organizations that will just take the book and they're not as accessible to the author. We want the author to feel I know Alexa's on this on on my team and I know that so and so is designing my cover. That kind of intimacy that's and that personalization is really important to us so we'll get on a brainstorming call and then from there the designer will come up with a proposal typically three different concepts and then from there we tinker away until the author feels that they have a cover that they really really love and uh, and that that's always the end result and that's what we strive for and then even when it comes to interior layout what kind of fonts look good for your book we don't want to always go with just standard fonts we like to play around with fonts and typography and typesetting. So those are the two pillars of the actual book production. And then we look at things like a good book synopsis. Are you winning people over with your Amazon description or your back cover matter? Do you have a good author bio that really lends credibility to yourself? Um, all of those types of things. What kind of book categories make sense? What would be a good retail price Comp you know, with comparable titles that are out there? So we pull all of that metadata together. And then what we do is we set up the books on various, the book, I should say, on various self-publishing platforms. So Kindle Direct Publishing is one. Ingram Spark is another example. Draft to Digital. And the nice thing about these is that it works on a print-on-demand model so that it saves the author, especially a first-time author, from taking on the onus of oh, I've just done like, I don't know, a 5,000 print run. Now I've got to find a place to put these copies. I have to figure out how I'm going to move them. No, these systems are all put into place so that the author can just kind of sit back and the logistics of sales and shipping and fulfillment, that's all taken care of by the platforms. So that's the publishing side of things. And then, of course, from there, there's marketing. And very often we'll pull, we'll do some marketing while we're putting together the book. A, a perfect example, an obvious example is website. There's no point in waiting until after your book is published to start working on a website. Have some of these things happening simultaneously so that they all come together at the right moment. So obviously a website design, we figure that out. A press kit for certain nonfiction authors if they really want to court media. A media kit or a press kit is really, really useful. Soliciting reviews, if somebody really wants to go after reviews, well, then we'll produce what we call an ARC, an advanced reader copy. So those would be copies that they could send out to particular influencers, thought leaders, you know, uh, trade review sources, and all of that stuff can happen while we are producing the book. And then, yeah, and then beyond that, well, then it's we have to think about social media and podcasts and 
other various vehicles, but we also, as much as we customize the book publishing experience, we also customize book marketing because not everyone's comfortable going on podcasts. Not everybody needs a media kit. So we don't have a cookie cutter solution. We really sit down with the author and we also figure out some authors, you know, they just want their book out there. Some authors have speaking gigs. I know, you know, you do speaking as well. So sometimes there are those back of room sales, as we call them, and maybe that's their biggest marketing vehicle. And it's not going to be social media and the media, traditional media. So we always sit down with authors because we want to know who are you? What are you currently doing to market? And, and what can we do to help you get to the next level? And each author is different. Yeah, that's a wonderful synopsis. And I know um, for the audience out there, um, a lot of them want to be thought leaders and influencers. So I'm just going to cut cut down to the very um, juicy questions that people want to know. And sure. one, one of them is, how do authors become a Amazon bestseller? Okay. <laughs> All right. So yes, yeah, so an Amazon bestseller is definitely a very sought after title. I wouldn't quite put it on the same level as a New York Times bestseller uh, for obvious reasons, but yes, an Amazon bestseller. So so Amazon, their algorithms are updated on an hour, like they're continuously being updated. So I should perhaps preface all of this by saying, I always tell, we run Amazon bestseller campaigns, and I always tell authors the primary goal of running an Amazon bestseller campaign, it's not to hit number one, although many, many of our authors do. The goal is really to have a nice concentrated awareness boost of your book, because the fact of the matter is you can be an Amazon bestseller for a day or two, and then all of a sudden you're no longer a bestseller. It doesn't mean that you're a failure as an author. It's just the reality is to really stay up there in those numbers, you need to be consistently selling books. And when you're first starting out, it's not easy to sell consistently a lot of books on Amazon. So what do you need to do? Well, the first thing you really need to do is you need to audit your Amazon categories. That's really the first thing. Amazon has so many different categories. What's key is to figure out what categories really fit your niche and get those categories assigned to your book listing. And that's honestly, that's probably the biggest bulk of the work is just researching those categories. That's something we do, of course, for our authors, you can do it on your own, but really figuring out your category. So if you've written a book on real estate investing, but you just decide to keep it in business general or entrepreneurship general, there are a lot of books in that category. So it's going to be hard for you to boost your ranking, but if you can you know, if you can drill down to a more precise category, that will help you immensely. And then, of course, it's all about telling people that, you know, your book is up on Amazon and we always will adjust the price for a couple of days when we run the campaign. And again, the goal is, yes, it's great to get that badge. That's a wonderful, nice uh, validation point, but it's also about getting a ton of people aware about your book. And I mean, we've run bestseller campaigns where we've had people have their ebook downloaded like a couple of thousand times. And that to me is worth so much more than being an Amazon bestseller because, wow, now I've got 2,000 more people who I probably would have never, ever connected with. And now they know about my book. Yeah, it's so interesting because it's kind of like vanity metrics, but it helps with yes. marketing <laughs> and advertising. So, absolutely, uh... <laughs> absolutely. And that's why I don't I don't want I don't like putting a lot of emphasis on the vanity part of it, although there's certainly nothing wrong. If you've hit number one, it's legit. You can tell people that you're an Amazon bestseller, but you can't hang on to that because it's really tough to sustain that, at least as an emerging author, even if you're even if you're an expert in your field, unless you have thousands of people on your mailing list, it's going to be hard to sustain that. So it's just better to be realistic without being discouraged. Yeah, and it's really interesting because um, you can gamify the way to become a number one. Mm -hmm. And it's basically just kind of hype it, hype it, you know, kind of offer your book for free or 99 mm -hmm. cents, um, mm -hmm. you know, and then get a review. And then you you get to that um, number one and then you screenshot it and then you can say you're... You <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and that's totally fine. Um, and that's really legitimate. And we we offer that to our authors as well. And it's it's important to some of them. And it's frankly, it does still mean something. It's just just keep in mind that you're not the only book on Amazon. That's the only thing. Just keep that in mind. Some humility can go a long way. 
Yeah. So my next question is, because I have books that sell consistently across everything. And like, I find that the people that leave reviews are the haters. So they try to like, you know, drag your book down or whatever. I but, was uh, reading some of your reviews. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're not, they're, some of them, you got some really good reviews. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it's like, you know, the haters and, um, mm. but uh, like, I was reading this statistic where people's, it's like the majority of books after like the first you know week or month they after that a lot of them they don't sell but it is it better to have like a consistent where you're selling monthly you know you're meeting your quota you know very little reviews um or just like have this like thousands of reviews and just kind of nobody's buying well that's that's an interesting question so the first thing i want to address is the whole amazon review thing this is definitely even before we run bestseller campaigns we always recommend to authors get some reviews let's wait you don't need 20 of them because 20 reviews frankly it takes a lot to get 20 reviews because it's human nature i mean i love reading i can't say i always leave reviews you know just because life gets in the way and we're busy with other things but i always recommend let's try to aim for 10 reviews because it often offers that social proof. Oh, people have read this book. And of course, uh, hopefully they all like it and they give at least four stars. Um, that's the first thing I would say. You, you, you know, you talk about that first month. I like to call that the F and F month. It's the, fr you know, the friends and family. Even if people are not interested in your topic, they're going to go out, they're going to read your book. They're going to talk about it to everyone they, you know, everyone they know. And that period, that honeymoon period is still vital for two things. You just might have some people in your network who can create that ripple effect and they talk to someone and they talk to someone. The other thing, too, is it's important to have a bit of confidence. Nothing's worse than you just kind of put your book up and I, you know, you don't tell anyone because maybe you're a little shy. It's a huge leap of faith to publish a book and not everyone feels ready to claim the title of author. So I still think that honeymoon period is important. As far as what is better, selling consistently or getting reviews consistently, I think for the majority of authors, at the end of the day, getting sales is perhaps a better goal than getting reviews just because, I mean, look, if you look on Amazon, some of the craziest best-selling books, they don't have nearly as many reviews as they've sold books just because it's human nature and not everyone is going to leave a review. So I would not put too much emphasis on reviews, but I always tell people, you know, there's nothing wrong even at the back of your book, especially your ebook. Did you like this book? Tell other people about it. Click here to leave a review. There's nothing wrong with soliciting reviews, but just be aware it's it's not going to be easy to get people to leave reviews. But reviews have value. They definitely have value. Yeah, I love that. And it's kind of like an extra step to leave a review. And it's either, like I said, it's either like a, you know, a fan or just somebody yeah. that just hated the book or whatever. Of course, of course. And I should mention, though, that you have to be ready that there are going to people who hate your book or sometimes people leave reviews that are so silly, you know, like they'll complain about the smallest thing in your book. And you're thinking, really, that's all you took away from that. But there's ultimately you have no control and you have to kind of let go of that. And that can be a tough mental shift for a lot of authors. It's just that it's that fear of rejection. Right. We have that fear of rejection. Yeah. Um, you know, there's so many questions, you know, how to get into Barnes and Noble, you know, oh, book yes. launch, um, you know, we could talk, um, but how can people find out more about you and the services that you offer? Absolutely. So they're always welcome to visit our website. That's triple W Axel author services. So that's two A's X E L like Lewis author services, all one word.com. I also actually love to hear from authors directly. I love getting emails from authors. It's, it's so much fun. So you can feel free to drop me a line, send me an email. My name is Alexa at Axel author services.com. Um, and I'm, I look forward, I always invite authors to, you know, it's a big world out there, you know, publishing, and there are always a lot of questions that need answers. So I'm always happy to do that. Yeah. And for all the audience, let's thank Alexa for coming on and um, be sure to check out her socials, give her a like and follow, as well as check out her services for self-published people that want to write a book or that have already wrote a book. And um, it's really cool. You know, once you write a book, it's like, you know, that kind of like, you can say you're an author. Yeah, and, um, absolutely. It adds a lot of authority, especially for nonfiction authors. I know, for instance, Chris, you service a lot of, you know, physicians. I mean, 
I work with everyone from real estate investors, people who are franchise experts, people who are physiotherapists. I mean, it's 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 really a nice extra notch in your belt to say that you've written a book and you've shared your knowledge. So there's power in that. Yeah. And then thanks so much for coming onto the podcast. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you.